Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So, after we've done with the trauma, now we will be moving to the disorders and we will start today with the shoulder disorders. So, the most important part of this lecture, it's, it's going to be a fast one, it's very important, it's very common. We will talk about the rotator cuff muscles. So, the rotator cuff muscles, they have a lot of causes of pain in the shoulder region. We have impingement syndrome, which is supraspinatus tendinitis or the chronic tendinitis. We have rupture of the rotator cuff muscles, acute calcific tendinitis, biceps tendinitis, and finally, adhesive capsulitis. So just to remember the uh, four important rotator cuff muscles of the shoulders, we have the supraspinatus, for import, very important, very common, okay? The origin is the supraspinous fossa, the scapula, until it reaches the superior and middle facet of the greater tuberosity of the proximal humerus. What's the function? Abduction. So it abducts the arm. The infraspinatus is in the infraspinous fossa and it attaches also to the middle facet of the greater tuberosity. The function is external rotation. Another external rotator is teres minor. So teres minor, middle half of the lateral border, Okay, and it attaches to the humerus in the inferior facet of the greater tuberosity. So these muscles, one abducts, which is supraspinatus, two external rotates, which is infraspinatus and teres minor, and finally, we have the subscapularis, which is in the subscapular fossa, which is internal, the internal rotator of the arm. This is a nice picture. You can see here the teres minor, okay? So when the teres minor is functioning, it will externally rotate the humerus. This is the long head and the lateral head, okay, of the triceps. We have here the latissimus dorsi, the teres major. We have this infraspinatus, which is a huge muscle in the, in the infraspinous region. We have the supraspinatus in the supraspinous region. And all of them are attached to the humerus around the shoulder, rotator cuff muscles. This is from the anterior aspect. This is the coracoid process, okay? And you can see here the long head of the biceps is going over the head of the humerus and it attaches to the superior part of the glenoid. This is the short head that's going to the uh, coracoid process, okay? This is the pectoralis minor and you can see here the teres major. You can see the subscapularis, which are the rotator cuff muscles. Impingement syndrome, very important, very common. It's very, very common. You, you will see it in orthopedic clinics like on daily basis. So basically a painful disorder which is thought to arise from repetitive compression of rubbing for the tendon. So which tendon is the supraspinatus? Because the supraspinatus, as we will see in the next pictures, it's moving in the subacromian space, which is a very tight space and it might have some rubbing. Normally, when the arm is abducted, the conjoint tendon slides under the coracoid arch, the coracoacromial arch. Um, then when it reaches 90 degrees, there is a natural tendency to extend the rotate of the arm, thus allowing the rotator cuff to occupy widest part of the subacromian space. <clears throat> okay, with external rotation, it allows the widest part to be accompanied by the rotator cuff muscles. So as you can see in this picture, here the supraspinatus tendon, Okay, this is the acromion, this is the coracoid and coracoacromial ligament. This is bursa. What's bursa? It's a flat membrane, has fluid inside, it decreases the friction. So whenever there is friction with any soft tissue in the body, you will find the bursa. So what will happen that in this area, this area in the subacromian region, it's closed space from the superior uh, humerus or from the superior part of the glenoid, the head of the humerus, to the Acromion. So this is space is very small. So when the supraspinatus tendon is moving and moving and moving, it might get inflamed. The pressure might be inside more. Sometimes there will be bony prominence, calcifications, and it's gonna give a lot of pain. And another time, look at the biceps tendon. It's attached to the superior uh, glenoid or labrum. Okay, so if the arm is basically abducted, and then moved to an internal and external rotation. This is the, the, the way when you do abduction, okay, for the arm, and you do internal and external rotation, 
this movement usually will give you impingement. This is a risk factor for impingement. So people who are doing wind cleaning, who are doing polishing, painters. So if whenever you are doing overhead activities, these patients might get impingement more than the other patients. So it might be get irritated. The attitude, abduction, slight friction, and internal rotation, this is called the impingement position. So you do abduction, slight friction, and internal rotation. Here, you are putting more pressure in the subacromian space, so you will elect the pain. That's why people usually, when you do abduction, slight friction, internal rotation, this is the position of impingement, and they will have pain. What are the other factors? It might have um, osteoarthritis in the acromioclavicular joint, osteophytes, subacromia bursa, the bursa might get inflamed and you will get bursitis. And this is a very known cause of the pain in the subacromia region. Healing, usually it's gonna be vascular congestion. So it's inflammatory process. So fluids are going from the intravascular to that place in the subacromian space, which is a closed space. It's gonna raise the pressure more pain, more congestion. Usually in young people, it's gonna be more painful and more rapid to heal because more fluids are going inside, it's gonna heal very fast. In the, old, in the elderly people, it's gonna be slower, okay? It will take more time, but the pain usually is less. Wear, tear, and after the repair, you can see here the tendon is being repaired. Clinical features. Usually the patients will present to your clinic from 40 to 60 years. This is the range. They will complain from pain just under the deltoid muscle. You can here see the acromion. After the acromion, this is the place where they have the pain. And they will be complaining, hey doctor, we can't really sleep at night when we are sitting or sleeping on our right side, for example, or left side, depending on the shoulder, which they have pain in. On examination, the shoulder will look normal, like grossly. When you look from outside, usually it's normal, but you will feel that there is tenderness uh, just anteriorly to the acromion uh, process. And on abduction, there is something called painful arc. Painful arc. So what's painful arc? When you do abduction, the muscle to do initiation of abduction from 0 to 15 is the supraspinatus. Then the deltoid will take over. At 60, there will be pressure on the deltoid, on the uh, supraspinatus, and it will cause pain. So there will be painful arc from 60 to 120, and after that, it will go. That's why it's called the painful arc. And you can see here in the picture, this is the painless area in yellow, painless area in yellow, and this is in orange, the painful arc. Pathognomic feature of supraspinatus tendinitis is the movement with the arm in full external rotation might be much easier. As we said, the position of impingement is with internal rotation. So it's gonna be painful. So you can do external rotation of your patients. It will give more space in the subacromian space. So the pain will be decreased. Crepitus or cl clicking if there is partial tear in the tendon. Okay, and in long standing cases, you might see some wasting of the muscles because of the pain. What's the impingement sign or how can test? As we said, it's flexion, abduction, flexion, and internal rotation. So they will start feeling the pain of the impingement. Another test nears impingement is flexion, forward flexion of the elbow. It's going to cause severe pain. The last test is called the empty can test, which is the patient's fully flex flexion and abduction with the level of the scapulas. Then they have their hands like this, their thumbs or, uh, pointing upward. And what do you do to, or to tell them? Just empty the cans. So when they empty the can, they are doing internal rotation. So now it's abducted, flexed, and internal rotation. Then you do flexion against resistance. You are pushing down, he's pushing up. So against resistance, it will elect the pain. So these are the tests we use usually for the impingement syndrome. X-ray, mm, you might not see except for some calcifications. MRI is more sensitive for sure. This is the X-ray showing some sclerosis in here. Complications. Now in complications, you might get subluxation. 
Okay, it's very important. And you might get osteoarthritis. Treatment, so how to treat these patients? It's, it's very simple. Always we start with the conservative, non-surgical measures. Because it's inflammation, a lot of fluids going inside, inflammatory process, so we have to give non uh, anti-inflammatory, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You might give them an injection, methyl prednisolone, okay? It might really help them. Uh, physiotherapy is important. Cold compressors in the inflammatory process is okay. But if the patient is very symptomatic, they are in pain, they are uh, active, sport, um, these are the cases where we operate. We, sometimes we go and decompress the subacromian space. We make it larger by doing some shaving of the, or, do, or it's called acromioplasty. So the space of the subacromian space will, will be more wide and it's gonna be more room for the, say, the rotator cuff to move. Um, if acromioclavicular osteophytes are present, we have to remove them for sure. Small tears of the cuff are repaired at the same time. So if you have another tears in the other rotator cuffs, you operate all in one. Okay, rupture tear of the rotator cuff. So partial tears, partial tears frequently occur with a supraspinatus tendons or with a tendinitis. It might have some, um, with the supraspinatus tendinitis, there will be tears because it also it's an inflammatory process. So when you do an MRI and you find micro ruptures in the tendon of the supraspinatus, you might say that this patient is having tendinitis. If there is complete tear and it's acute, patients usually feel a pop, okay, from the uh, supraspinatus tendon. And if they had already tendinitis, they will feel it. Like they will tell you that I feel or I heard, heard a pop in my shoulder. So how to differentiate what to do for these patients? There is a very nice test. It's called lidocaine injection test. So what will you do that you will give a lidocaine injection in the subacromian space? There will be anesthesia and there is no pain. So you now tell the patient to abduct his arm actively alone. If they can abduct with pain-free, so it was partial. If they cannot, so it was complete. So this is the difference between partial and complete. Okay. This is the lidocaine test. Um, complete tears, the active abduction, okay. You can raise the arm of the patient after you're giving the lidocaine and just leave it and it will drop. It's, go, it's called drop arm sign. This is an indication for a full or complete tear. Another time, this is the pictures. This patient was having pain. He got a lidocaine injection. Now he's moving. He's fully abducting the shoulder. This patient, the right side is not abducted. He had a lidocaine injection. Still, he cannot abduct. Treatment. Again, if it's inflammatory process, painkillers, ice packs. And after that, after two, three weeks, you can start with heat, exercise, and local anesthesia. After that, in three months, you can do physiotherapy and so on. If complete tear uh, operation is contraindicated in old and long standing cases because it's pain, painless, so they are not complaining of pain. Okay, for acute calcific tendinitis, we have acute shoulder pain because of the deposition of calcium hydroxyapatite crystals. Okay, it's very simple what to do painkillers because they will be presenting with pain. The most important thing is to give them painkillers. Sometimes you can give them in injections and if it was very severe and they are causing them many, many pain, you can go and do surgery. And this is x-ray showing you a calcific deposition in the supraspinate tendon. You can see how large this calcific deposition here. Okay, what's for the biceps tendon? Now for the biceps tendon, might gives you tendinitis. Usually it's the long head. The long head which is going through its groove in the humerus, bicipital groove, and going to the superior part of the labrum, which is in the glenoid. So, most of the times they are coming with the rotator cuffs. So rotator cuffs plus bicipital tendinitis. Okay, so we have two tests, which are called speeds tests. 
and Jurgensen. So what speeds is resisted flexion of the elbow straight with the forearm, as you can see in here. This is a straight elbow, and he's trying to flex the elbow against resistance. And Jurgensen, it's resisted supination, because you all know that the biceps is the main supinator of the forearm. So he's trying to do supination, and the doctor is resisting it. Treatment. Deep trans uh, friction usually brings relief and local heat. Corticosteroids again because it's inflammatory and anterior acromioplasty if indicated. What if it's rupture? Usually when it ruptures acutely, for example, in the gym, young adults, you, they can feel a pop that popped in the shoulder. It might be painful. Sometimes you can see bruises and hematoma in the arm. Uh, because of weightlifting and the picture will be like this you can see a lot of hematoma and they will present with this sign which is a bulge in the bicipital region which is called Popeye sign Popeye sign this is Popeye sign what's the treatment if they are old just leave it alone it's not, it's not going to do anything it's conservative management usually we do uh, for young active people we do uh, repair. It might be with, uh, we can reattach the bicipital tendon with the humerus with an anchor suture or something. Finally, adhesive capsulitis. What's adhesive capsulitis? It's pain. It's pain and pain and pain. Over about 18 months, it starts with pain, then stiffness, more stiffness, then less pain, then the stiffness subsides. What's the cause? We don't know really. So basically, these people, they have a high risk factor if they have diabetes, deeper train disease, hyperlipidemia, hyperthyroidism, cardiac disease. So this is the sequence. It starts with pain, then stiffness, then the pain subsides, stiffness stays, then it resolves. So this is, it usually takes about 18 months. How can we diagnose frozen shoulder? Free x-ray, painful shoulder, then stiff, in all movements, in all range of motion, flexion, extension, abduction, abduction, internal, external rotation, all of them. They start with pain, then stiffness, then the pain resolve, and the stiffness resolve. So this is the sequence. A cardinal feature is stubborn lack of active and passive motion in all directions. As I mentioned, there is no movement in the shoulder. And when you do arthrography, what's arthrography? That we bring a die and we put it inside the capsule of the joint. Usually we can see the nice capsule, the joint line, but here as you can see, all of the dye, this white dye just went out of the joint because it's adhesive capsulitis. It was adhesed to each other. It might be infection, it might be post-traumatic stiffness, diffuse stiffness and regional pain syndrome, yes. So what's the treatment? Conservative, usually it's conservative. Analgesia, non-steroidal drugs, local heat, exercise, physiotherapy, you might give them injection. And sometimes for the severe cases, young people, you might go and do surgery. The surgery is the division of the interval between the supra and infraspinatus. It will give them dramatic improvement in the range of motion. Okay, another common thing, which is shoulder dislocation. Shoulder dislocation. The most common type, as you all know, is the anterior, which is 95% of the cases. Usually the anterior sort of dislocation causes the attachment and sometimes lengthening and stretching of the anterior capsule and ligaments. So the clinical features, how will the patient present? Typically the patients are young and men, okay? They have recurrent shoulder dislocation. The position of dislocation, it's abduction, external rotation and extension so this is called the apprehension test apprehension test so if you know someone who's having a recurrent dislocation you can just put his arm in abduction external rotation and extension and they will feel please stop it's gonna dislocate so they will feel fear that it's gonna dislocate this is called apprehension test so the apprehension is the position of dislocation after they are feeling uh, fear because they want to dislocate their shoulder what to do you can put your palm 
on the anterior part of the shoulder and pushing backwards. So what's going to happen that that fear will go away. So it's called relocation test. So apprehension, abduction, external rotation, and extension. Pushing on the anterior part of the humerus, it's called relocation test. Okay. Um, between the episodes, the diagnosis rests on apprehension sign. So apprehension sign is very important. I just told you about. This is the apprehension sign. You can see it's abduction, external rotated, and extended. And the patient looks uh, under stress. Okay, so on x-ray for the recurrent dislocator, usually you will find two very important signs to know, which are Hill-Sax and Bankert. Well, hill sacs is depression in the posterior superior part of the humeral head because of the recurrent dislocation. Now the bone is having an effect. And the other way around, on Bankert, it's the glenoid. So you can see here, it's empty. The glenoid is empty. The humeral head is dislocated anteriorly, medially, and inferiorly. If you look at hill sacs, look at the depression in here. It's a depression in the humeral head because of the recurrent dislocation. Because the head will go down in here, so the glenoid will make a hole in the head, which is hill sacs. On the other way, the labrum will be detached and there will be a bankert lesion. And you can see it in the MRI in here that it is detached because of the recurrent dislocation. Treatment, what to do for this patient. Frequent dislocation, especially if they are painful. If you have a painful dislocation, which is recurrent, you have to go and treat this patient. Fear of recurrent subluxation. So if he wants to do sports, basketball player, baseball, they want to use their shoulder a lot and they are in fear to dislocate their shoulders, you have to go and fix because they want to get back to their life and sports. And we have many types of operations. It's not very important to know them, but it's good to know. We can reattach the glenoid labrum. We can do shortening and tightening of the anterior capsule, so it will be more strong, so less dislocation, more stable. Reinforcement of the anterior inferior capsule using adjacent muscles. This is for the anterior. What about the posterior? Posterior is much rare, it's about 5%. Usually, usually it's either direct trauma, electrical shock, or epilepsy. This is the most common. You can diagnose by X-ray, by light bulb sign or CT scan. Treatment is strengthening of the muscle, conservative measures. Operation reconstruction is only if disability is really marked. This uh, is no gross joint laxity. Very important. For the multidirectional, multidirectional instability, the problem in most of these patients, they are having ligamentous hyperlaxity. So if they're having ligamentous hyperlaxity, what will you do in the operation? Basically, it's very hard to go and do all the ligaments. That's why these patients, usually they come with bilateral shoulder dislocation. The most important thing to do for these patients, physiotherapy, 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 strengthen the muscles around the shoulder so it gives you more stability. This is the most important part. Surgical treatment is very, very rare in these patients, and the failure rate is very high after surgery. The last thing is disorders of the glenohumeral joint. This is a non-orthopedic thing. So basically tuberculosis, the most important thing, you will have wasting of the muscles around the humerus, and you will have axillary lymph nodes sometimes. On X-ray, you can find early diffraction of the bone in the side of the joint. In later cases, you can see cystic destruction. What's the treatment differently as tuberculosis? You have to give them anti-tuberculosis drugs, rifampicin, and so on. And the shoulder should be rested until acute symptoms have settled, okay? Then you will go to physiotherapy and exercise again for sure. Rheumatoid arthritis, this is a different lecture, but you can have rheumatoid arthritis for sure in the shoulder, the acromioclavicular joint, the shoulder joint, and other synovial pouches. It can be affected by rheumatoid arthritis or chronic synovitis. Because they have pain, painkillers, painkillers, painkillers is important, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, active movements are limited, okay? Passive are painful and accommodate pain bar marked, marked crepitus. So it's very important in the examination. X-ray, progressive loss of the articular space because it's as the rheumatoid arthritis. What to do? General measures, methylprednisolone, sometimes it will reduce the effect of the rheumatoid arthritis. If there is synovitis and it's persisting and it's not just relieving, you can go and do synovectomy. We remove the synovium because it's the origin of the rheumatoid arthritis problem and 
usually they get better. Arthroplasty and finally arthrodesis. Imagine sometimes we can fix the shoulder. We do arthrodesis for two bones together and fix them. We remove the shoulder. It's like you put the humeral head with the glenoid and fix them just to eliminate the pain. You can see here the severe osteoarthritis happening from the rheumatoid disease. Another x-ray of severe arthritis again. Osteoarthritis. So a lot of causes, congenital dysplasia, local trauma, long-standing rotator cuff lesions, uh, rheumatoid disease, and AVN of the head. A lot of clinical features, the most important is pain and pain and pain, 50s to 60s. Um, the x-ray, you can see characteristic features of loss of articular space, okay? We talked about osteoarthritis last lecture, and you can see here the five main things you can see, which is decreased joint space, osteophytes, subchondral sclerosis, subchondral system, deformities, treatment, analgesia for sure, and exercise to improve the mobility. And if you still have pain and pain and pain, sometimes we have to go for operation. Okay, Maluki shoulder, Maluki shoulder, basically it's patient present with swelling. They present with the swelling in the shoulder. X-ray show bizarre destructive form of arthritis. This is very bad disease. It's not common, hope that's good, it's not common. It's associated with massive tears in the rotator cuff and you can see here the massive destruction of the humeral head. Now the scapula and the clavicle, we have the springled shoulder, okay? It's very important to know these like three diseases that we will talk about. So the scapula usually is normally completed in the neck to descend by the third month in the fetal life. The problem here that it remains high. So high scapula is called sprinkled shoulder. Uh, it's elevated, smaller, prominent. They will have painless, but abduction may be limited. They cannot abduct because you know abduction at some level it will give you the motion from the scapulothoracic joint, okay? This is a picture showing a sprinkled shoulder, a high scapula, and this is the, how it looks. Klippelfield syndrome. So it's a very rare congenital disorder. It's in pediatrics, basically. They have bilateral failure of the scapular descent, and they will give you short neck, whipped neck, and less cervical mobility. And this is the picture of them. Finally, a winged scapula is important because here the scapula is projecting out, okay? It has many, many causes. Usually weakness of the serratus anterior muscle. So it's either muscular or neurological. Long thoracic nerve injury, brachial plexus injury, uh, viral infections, or muscle dystrophy. So it's important to keep these differential diagnoses in mind. Usually what's happening, we tell the patient to push the wall, and when they push the wall, you can see the projection of the scapula posteriorly. And you can see here one of the tests, the other one, it's very obvious. Acromioclavicular instability, it's common after dislocation of this joint. Sometimes it will be more and more dislocated or ligamentous hyperlaxity, it will be unstable. So the acromioclavicular joint will be unstable. On X-ray, sometimes you can see a difference between the acromion and the clavicular. As you can see here, for example, in this picture, you can see by eyes, by inspection, that you have acromioclavicular disability or instability. And sometimes these people have pain or they have dislocation when they have work or lifting something weight, they will have dislocation again and again. The treatment depends on the age, on, on the signs and symptoms. And this is an X-ray showing here the clavicle, how far it is from the acromion. Okay, finally, osteoarthritis of the acromioclavicular joint, it's common in all people. It will give them pain and pain and pain. X-ray will show the osteoarthritic changes for this joint. So give them injection corticosteroids, painkillers, and if it's not relieved, not relieved, you can excise the lateral part of the clavicle. So that was all for this lecture. It was a fast one, very important, very common, and we'll see you in the next lecture, hopefully.